Very good morning. Now, today we're going to be reading a very difficult passage, which is from Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 15 to 27. Now, before we go into that, um, let us just uh, consider, consider as a whole, the book of Ezekiel. And we ask the question, why is it so hard? Why is it difficult to read the prophetic books? You know, the book of the prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the minor prophets, Amos, Hosea, and so on. So they are very, I mean, it's quite difficult to read them. And um, I was thinking about this question, and we say, okay, some of the answers can be, we don't understand the big picture. For example, like Genesis, is a story, okay, there's something happening. Um, the life of Jesus, the life and death of Jesus, is something happening as well. So you can see like a beginning and some form of an end. But the prophets, it's very difficult to find the structure. And also it can be very difficult emotionally to read the prophets. Because there seems to be a lot of scolding. And uh, as young people don't like to be scolded, older people even less like to be scolded. So we, we see the book of prophets and it's very difficult emotionally to read so much negativity. All right? And third, maybe uh, another reason, which is a big reason, is we don't understand what it's about. We don't understand the history, we don't understand the culture. So these are sub three reasons, I believe, that's difficult for us to read. But let's consider in the example of the book of Ezekiel. There are 48 chapters. So to understand the overview, what happens is that the first 24 chapters talks about the prophecies against Jerusalem. So all the text, all the scripture is against Jerusalem. Following after that is against other nations. So we have an idea, okay? so we have structure, which means that we can kind of better understand how the book is uh, to be read. Now the second point is that it's hard to read. But bear in mind there are many songs right, which are actually coming out from the prophets. For example, things like um, God will come and save. That one comes from Isaiah. We have uh, Great is thy faithfulness. That was also from the prophets. Uh, God will make a way. Some of the verses are actually coming from uh, the prophetic books. So there are great stories of hope, there are great uh, passages, verses where there's a light rather than darkness. And even in the book of Ezekiel, the last batch, the last bit, uh, verse, uh, chapter 33 to 48, is about the restoration. So after going through all, your, all this uh, hardship where it seems that it's always against Jerusalem, later on, after 33 to 48, there is hope, there is a sort of like looking towards the future where God will be very close and in fact, we'll be with his people again. The last bit, don't understand the history and culture. Well, this one is quite tricky, huh? but if we look into the over, like last and last and sermon, we look at the life of a Jerusalem, where we look at, you know, uh, it came from being born and nobody wanted a baby, and then all the way until it became an adulterous wife, and then it got stoned, right? So being punished for its adultery. Now, even in this context, if you look at the, the Bible and you look at the history of the Bible, you see that the beautiful queen where Israel or Jerusalem is at its peak, where it's great and beautiful and wonderful, is captured very nicely in 1st and 2nd Samuel, where we have the story of King David. So when you read King David, you can understand, uh, I mean, the, the grandeur, the splendor of the nation of Israel and how they put Jerusalem to such a high regard. You can read 1st and 2nd Samuel to gain a taste or to gain a better understanding of that history. And with regards to the adulterous wife, that's where 1st uh, and 2nd Kings would help. And then you read the prophets, you read the background of the 1st and 2nd Kings. When you read the prophets, you can fill in the blanks a lot better. Okay? So, and if we break the Ezekiel, how we break it apart, what happens is that it is a long straight line all the way down to the break of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem will break down, is stripped for death, and that happens in chapter 33, verse 21, when Jerusalem falls. When the messenger comes and says that, Jerusalem has fallen. Now, in this context, we have uh, the first vision of the throne and the second vision when the glory leaves. That one we have covered already. And we say, okay, to better understand the context, it is also important for us to understand the culture. So, for example, how important is the temple to the Jewish people? Or how, what is this cherubim? So, if you don't understand the Jewish context, it can be difficult to, to read. I mean, I, I don't understand what someone is talking about. And even more so, when it goes into the sign acts. So, if you're reading, if you've been following Ezekiel, 
Uh, you see that he laid siege on a block of clay. He was lying on his side for days, I mean, year or a year plus. He's cooking food over human excrement. He's cutting, weighing, binding, and burning only hair, and he's packing bags for exile. And you're reading all these things, and you find that I don't understand why it's all these things are happening. You gain a better understanding if you have read through Leviticus or the, uh, the earlier books. So you understand, for example, that burning excrement or eating food is unclean. Okay, so they, there's a big emphasis on the priesthood to be clean, so they always keep themselves clean, uh, not to be contaminated. But this thing about not understanding the history and culture, if you consider a, a bit more, the Jewish people live in those times and they live in that culture and they understand all the relevance here, but they don't listen. In fact, what is the Jewish response? The Jewish response is, in chapter 12, it says, the days grow long and every vision comes to nothing. They refute the vision of Ezekiel. The vision comes to nothing. Then they say again, the vision that Ezekiel, that he, Ezekiel, sees is for many days from now, and he prophesies for times far off. Long, long, long time again, don't worry about it. This is the response of the Jewish people who live in those history, historical times and who live in those cultural times. So the, the problem of understanding the words of Ezekiel doesn't necessarily come from mind. The mind is not the problem. The problem is this. In the very beginning, God really said, but the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. So disregard all that thing about history and culture. Those are very, very important things. But the first thing that we must do is that we must have the desire to really want to hear the word of God, to understand. And from that desire, the Holy Spirit will guide us. Not through a big chunk where we understand completely everything, but through delicious trickles where we understand bits and bits of the beautiful scripture. With that, let us pray that our hearts are not like the Jewish people who are hard and don't want to listen, but let us pray that we, our hearts are open to hearing the word of the Lord. Come, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, O Lord, for your word. Thank you, O Lord, for the prophetic books, O Lord. And Lord Jesus, I pray that as we continue to read on Ezekiel, Lord, I pray that you will open up all our hearts, all our minds, Lord, that we can understand more of your word. And not just understanding in a mental level, but Lord, let it touch our hearts and let it change our lives so that our relationship with you, Lord, for that is what you love, our relationship with you, that is what you desire, becomes stronger, becomes deeper, becomes closer, Lord, for you desire us. So, so Lord, I pray that uh, as uh, today's... Uh, uh, words are shared, that uh, these words will change the lives of my brothers and sisters here. Thank you so much, O Lord, for this day. Uh, all glory be to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. So let us hear the word of God. And let us turn towards uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 24. All right? So let us turn towards Ezekiel chapter 24. Verse 15. And if you've been following the sign acts, you'll find that Ezekiel has really suffered quite a lot. And here, in the last bit of this chapter, okay, remember we break the chapter, first to 24, uh, chapter 1 to chapter 24 is the prophecies against uh, Jerusalem. And just in the last chapter, prophesying against Jerusalem, we find Ezekiel uh, going through I would say the most difficult sign act, the most personal sign act, the most painful thing that he had to do. And that is, um, we read. Chapter 24, verse 15 to 27. The word of God came to me, son of man, with one blow, I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep, or shed any tear. Groan quietly, do not mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of mourners. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening, my wife died. The next morning, I did as I had been commanded. 
Then the people asked him, Won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? So I said to them, The word of the Lord came to me, Say to the house of Israel, This is what the sovereign Lord says, I am about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. The sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword, and you will do as I have done. You will not cover the lower part of your face, or eat the customary food of mourners. You will keep your turbans on your heads, and your sandals on your feet. You will not mourn or weep, but will waste away because of your sins and groan among yourselves. Ezekiel will be assigned to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the Sovereign Lord. And you, Son of Man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes, their heart's desire, and their sons and daughters as well. On that day, a fugitive will come to tell you the news. At that time, your mouth will be open, you will speak with him and will no longer be silent. So you will be assigned to them, and they will know that I am the Lord. In the first few verses, we really read something that can be difficult for us to hear, which is, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, with one blow, I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Who is I? God. So in this passage, it is not Satan who removes. It is not um, the opponents of Ezekiel that removes. It is God himself that removes. And who does God, or what does God remove? The delight of your eyes. So far in Ezekiel, there is very little mention of the life or the, you know, the personality of Ezekiel. It's very little is written. But in this side, we see that there's one thing that Ezekiel really learned. And that was his wife. And after going through all the things that Ezekiel went through, preaching to a word to people who don't want to hear. And there is nothing in the scripture that says that Ezekiel did anything wrong. So this was not a punishment for any sin that Ezekiel did. He was a loyal servant all the way through. And yet, God said, I'll take away the delight of your eyes. This passage itself is a very difficult passage. And we can ask the question, why do the servants of a good God suffer? Why is it that servants of a good God suffer? And for this, let us look at uh, people. There is not much written on Ezekiel, on his life personally, but let us look into uh, other Christians who have suffered all as servants of a good God. And those are missionaries. So as a, let's uh, look into the life of this person called Adoniram Judson. Adoniram Judson was a missionary a long time ago. And um, he came over from America all the way to the US. Uh, sorry, US all the way to Burma. And uh, during those times it was very difficult. Huh? And he was going to be a missionary, and uh, before he departed, what happened was that he, he liked a girl, a like a woman. So he liked a lady called Anne, and he wrote a letter. So, uh, maybe a bit small, I'll read it out. A letter written by Adonarium Judson to Anne Hasselheim's uh, father, in which he asked permission to marry her. Now, those who are married, and those who hope to be married, when you're thinking of you know, asking the father-in-law for the hand of Daughter, what would you say? I'll give you, I'll give your daughter everything. All that I have, all that I am, I give everything to your daughter. She will live in the palace, she'll drive a good car, she will bear many children, and all will be taken care by me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you promise so many things, you know, promise all the good things because you want the father in law to say, please take her and let her have a good life. For Adoniram Johnson, this is what he wrote in his letter to the father in law, potential father in law. He said, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring, to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to see her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent 
to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory, with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise, which shall redound to her Saviour from hidden safe, through her means, from eternal woe and despair. Very uh, old English, huh? Um, but in essence, I don't promise you riches. I don't promise you joy. A different joy. I promise you suffering, insults, degradation, persecution, and even a violent death. How many fathers over here can say yes? To release the daughters or to release the sons? I would say there are not many people who can say yes to this. The wonderful thing about Anne Hesseltine's father was he said she's old enough to decide. You ask her. <laughs> <laughs> that was the answer. And Anne Hesseltine, what she did was she said yes. And this is the life of missionaries huh, in the olden days. But I would say it's not so olden. Today also there are missionaries who make the exact same statement of faith. When they say that, I don't know whether it's a road, but I'll go with God sent me. And I want to say that I wish, so wish to tell you that Adoniram Judson lived a happy life. His wife Anne Hazeltine died. The children they had died. Adoniram also uh, married a second time. The wife died again. The children also many died. He married a third time, and third time the wife didn't die first. He died first. <laughs> he died a violent one. He was actually on a ship, and uh, he was in a lot of pain, and he vomited. And in his last breath, he said, that "How few there are who die so hard." That is the life of the missionary Adoniram Judson. And one of the quotations that he said was, If I had not felt certain that every additional trial was ordered by infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived my accumulated sufferings. A lot of the missionaries, this is not one example, many of the missionaries from before, they have lost a lot of things. They have lost many of their loved ones. And in fact, I can sometimes tell you, the missionary schools in Sarawak, many of them were established by missionaries who had to leave families, had to leave their safety, came over here to be wrecked by sickness, by malaria. Many of them died to build up schools, hospitals. This is what missionaries have done. And they built up churches as well. And all this is for the sake, not for the sake of their Lord Jesus Christ. And we consider the legacy of Adoniram Judson. Adoniram Judson was one of the earlier missionaries to this country called Burma. During that time, there was nobody who went to Burma because it was just hostile against missionaries. And Adoniram was in prison and he was treated very poorly. And we fast forward to today, what happens is that Burma, there are Christian churches, there are Baptist churches over there. Um, and we have been privileged and honored to have Burmese uh, couple with us. Uh, Sister Murray and Brother Palmer last time. And they have shared their lives with us, taking care of our Sunday school children, taking care of uh, themselves. And they have also given, uh, how to say, they shared their life with us. And currently they are now in Australia. Families such as this came about because somebody somewhere, a long time ago, shared the gospel, established churches so that the word of God is preached. And right now there are many Burmese Christians. Not a majority, but Maybe. And this is a question that they ask, is it worth it? From the Kingdom of God perspective, his blood was so, such that other Christians may live. And so Burma is, has 
Christian presence, as the presence of God in their country, because of missionaries like Adonai Johnson, and the same with missionaries all over the place. And with that thought, I want to say that God does remove pain. We do pray for healing. We do pray for end to suffering. We do pray that Lord take away this pain from me. But we also bear in mind that the same God, the same God who removes pain, is also the same God who hardens us against pain, who strengthens us against pain, such that pain does not overcome, such that pain, suffering, does not become the only thing that we think about when we wake up in the morning, but such that God strengthens us to face the days ahead, regardless of the tragedies of our lives. And I can tell you, as you read the missionaries, the life of missionaries, it really put things into context. The pain and suffering that we say, I'm not saying that it's, yours is trivial. I am not saying that. Even my life, I would say we go through everybody's suffering. But it does help us put things into context. And with regards to the suffering servants of God today, there are people who are still missionaries today. And I ask that we read the lives of missionaries. And I have uh, this, uh, I printed out this book, so it's a little booklet, Adonarium Judson. It's written by uh, uh, John Piper. And I have uh, they have been, I've asked permission, and they have, the publisher has kindly agreed to photocopy. Normally they don't like people photocopy. So photocopy uh, 60 copies for, for this sermon. So what happens is that behind, uh, over there, when you exit, uh, you can actually take a copy. Only 60 copies. Um, but you, if you cannot get a hard copy, you can get it online. So just look for Adoniram Judson, uh, John Piper. It should lead you straight to the, to the ebook. And in here, if you read it through, you'll find a bit more, 24 pages, very short. Uh, 24 pages about the life of this uh, missionary. And I do feel that once we read the missionaries and we read the Bible, and we put the two things together, we'll be able to sense the, some of the teachings that is coming around nowadays, and we can have a better understanding on how to uh, respond to such teachings. Where, for example, uh, it's said that Christians don't suffer. Then I would wonder, uh, what did the missionaries do? Another thing is, we should pray for missionaries today. And we do that. This church has sent um, Uncle Kokmao and Pisario uh, over to Bintudu, uh, so they are mission team. That's why the benches are a bit empty today. They brought over 20 plus uh, young people over there. And uh, mission team. So they go over there to share the good news, to encourage the pastors, to encourage the church to share the good news. And uh, there are missionaries all around the world still, so do pray for them. And even uh, in Miri also there are missionaries, missionary families. And if you do know them, uh, support them, encourage them, pray for them, that uh, God has indeed called them. And the missionary life is uh, not an easy life. It is living to the call of God. I would also encourage the church, the brothers and sisters here, to go on mission trips. Whether it is uh, youth, church, uh, selves, or whatnot, I encourage you guys to go on mission trips, whether it's local or international or wherever. Because then, in that short trip, you can also, I mean, you are serving God, you are exposing yourself to what mission is. And you go there maybe only for a few days or one week, two weeks, uh, then you reflect on how the missionaries go and do this for the rest of their lives. And perhaps the greatest thing that can be done within the church itself is some of you to be called to missionary. And this is a calling. It's not, uh, go, it's not like going to Disneyland, where you go there, have fun, and come back. Some of you over here may be called to be a missionary. And I say this with um, how to say, uh, with hesitance, because even Christian, fa Christian fathers and mothers may not necessarily release their children to go into the mission field, to become a full-time missionary. But if this is indeed your calling, I trust we have testimonies about this, where, where young people, old people, enter the mission field and dedicate their lives to sharing the Word of God. Having said this, young people, 
uh, don't go and pack your bags and leave tomorrow. <laughs> uh, first thing is you must honor your parents. So if you really must do this, make sure that you do this after, with, hopefully with your family's blessing, but definitely when you're no longer under the shelter, right? when you are of age. So don't pack your bags and go off to China. Okay, so with that, now having gained a perspective on the suffering of the servants of God, we can perhaps look into what Ezekiel went through and see that his life indeed is tough, as is for uh, servants of God. And then we read the next part. The next part says that, um, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Why are you acting like this? The people, of, the people in those times that did not ask Ezekiel, why, why is it that you suffer? Why do you, Ezekiel, a servant of good God, suffer? They don't ask that question. They ask a different question. Won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Why are you acting like this? And what they're referring to is, what does the death of Ezekiel's wife have to do with me? Your wife died. So what? What does it do with me? And God then answers. And you bring it up, what it says is, so I said to them, the word of God came to me, say to the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign God says. I am about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. The sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword. Two things to be taken away. One is the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the temple. The second one is the sons and daughters. So what does this mean? The temple of God is something that the people have looked to. It's something that they treasure, something like their own wife in the nation of Israel. There's nothing more precious than the temple of God because they remember the history. This is where the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord came down in a cloud and shining light and it resided, it came to the temple. They remember this, they know this. And now God himself is saying, I will take away my sanctuary, what you look towards. Why? Surely a sanctuary, a temple is a good thing. It is a symbol of God's presence. Why is God taking this away from the Israelites? Shouldn't it stand? Shouldn't it be still? So that the people can look toward the temple, look toward the temple for support, look toward the temple for encouragement, look toward the temple and not to God. What happened was the people of Israel, as you saw in the previous chapters, they do not, they no longer look towards God. Instead, they look towards bricks. They look towards a symbol. They look towards their history. They look towards their genes for salvation, for deliverance. They did not look towards God. So God is saying, this thing which you continue to look towards, because what it says is, as long as the temple of God stands, we will return. As long as the temple of God stands, the people of Israel will have a hope. As long as the temple of God stands, isn't it as long as the living God lives? So they have replaced, and this is a danger for Christians as well, when you replace good things, temple, church, with something which is immense, that cannot be put into a block, when we put God and replace God with bricks, cannot. So, looking into that, how about our Baptist Church rebuilding project? And then we say a wrong way of interpretation. I'll say right now, the wrong way of interpreting this is that now surely it means that there is no longer any need for us to build a church because God Himself has now destroyed His own temple, which is obviously more precious. So therefore, this uh, church rebuilding uh, project is uh, not biblical. Or at least maybe not relevant for today's time. Bear in mind, please bear in mind, again if we look through the Bible, God himself asked Moses to build a tabernacle. God himself told David that your son will build the temple of God because your blood is too, your, sorry, your hands are too bloody. So your son Solomon, whose name Shadow, will build the temple. When Solomon built the temple and dedicated it to God, the presence of God himself came and there was light inside the temple. And all throughout time, God has treasured his temple. This is going to be the temple that bears my name. 
And even if you say that was the past, now it's no longer. After this um, uh, Ezekiel, you see at the end, there is a new temple. So God also institutes a new temple. In the prophet Haggai, he also says it's time to build a temple. So we cannot conclude just by reading these things, and then we say that, okay, I don't want to build a church, therefore I say that this supports my argument. That is wrong. We must understand what does the text actually want us to do. And in this case, what it's saying is that the church rebuilding project cannot replace God. We cannot put our focus, we cannot put everything in this, and we break our friendships, we break our relationships, we break everything in the church there just to build the building. In everything that we do, we must put God first. And by putting God first, that also means being humble, being loving, being kind, being gentle, helping one another, and in doing so, building the church, the physical and the spiritual. So do not let this be a warning to the church. Let us not put the fundraising, because uh, as the years, as the next one year, two years go by, there's going to be quite a bit of stress, as everybody tries hard to actually you know, build the church. We're working together. Um, and so I do pray that we will continue a uni united spirit. Okay? The sons and daughters. This is a bit more painful. When the sons and daughters are taken away, what happens is, when God removes our pride and joy, there is nothing else but God. When we continually look towards something, whether it is our children, whether it's a temple, whether it's our bank account, whether it's our fixed deposit, car, house, whatever it is, when all these things are going to be our center of our attention, and if one day God removes all these things, what happens is that you have left nothing but God. And that is the lesson that God wants to give the Israelites. There is nothing else. There is absolutely nothing else. There is only one thing that you can go for, and that is God Himself. And let this not we let I do pray that we don't uh, wait until such a time happens. And as the next part talks about mourning, and if we compare with the previous passage when Ezekiel does not mourn, and we say we see that, uh, and you will do as I have done. You will not cover your mustache and beard or eat a piece of food of mourners. You will keep your turbans on your heads and your sandals on your feet, so same as with Ezekiel's earlier statement. You will not mourn or weep, same as the before one, but something different, but you will waste away because of your sins and go among yourselves. So everything that Ezekiel has done, everything that Ezekiel has done, you will also suffer. What does it mean by not mourning? The reason why they cannot mourn is because the events will be so tragic, so sudden, so they cannot, they cannot take it in. In the morning, for example, if someone dies, there is going to be customs. The customs takes in. Okay, so the traditions of the church, you have the wake, you have the funeral, you have the speech, you have all these things. But what if everybody, somebody has died? They have somebody, everybody has suffered grief. Where can they go? Who will comfort? Who will preach the sermon on the funeral? When every single person, musicians, Preachers, everybody has suffered grief. The tragedy will be so sudden, so dramatic, that we don't know how to mourn. That is what Ezekiel is demonstrating. So, when the people ask, what does this mean to us? Why do you not mourn? Ezekiel also, uh, God also says, Ezekiel will sign to you. You will do just as he has done. When this happens, you will know that I am the sovereign God. When this happens, what is this happens? What is this event that God is talking about? And what is this event? And you, he emphasized, and you, son of man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes, their heart's desire, and their sons and daughters as well, on that day, a fugitive will come to tell you the news. What day, what news, what event? Chapter 33, verse 21, Jerusalem falls. The city, the temple will fall, and where everybody said every vision comes to nothing, and he prophesies of times far off, God will now make it true. And he says that at that time your mouth will be open, you will speak with him, and will no longer be silent. What is he talking about? In the very, very beginning, the first vision, God said to Ezekiel, I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be silent and unable to rebuke them. 
for they are rebellious people. Another sign that God says that this is done by God is that the mouth will be opened and he can speak. But Ezekiel has been talking all the while, so what do you mean by he'll be silent? It's kind of like if we are, I'm a preacher, right? So I speak over here, then when I come down, I cannot speak. Because I can only speak the word of God. So I cannot rebuke, I cannot scold, I cannot encourage. So my mouth is basically silent amongst the people. But when it comes to speaking the word of God, Ezekiel speaks with power and authority. And God is saying that in case you believe, in case the people think that Jerusalem fall because of the might of Babylon, because of the might of an army, God is saying that is Jerusalem falls because I, God, made it fall. The sovereign Lord says that all these things, if you look at the 24 chapters of Ezekiel, the prophecies against Jerusalem, this is done by God, not by men. And he's saying this is the sovereign Lord. When this happens, you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. So you will be assigned to them and they will know that I am the Lord. So we, we look at three points. Ezekiel, God's servant, uh, God's servant uh, suffers much. When God removes our glory, we have nothing else but God. And Ezekiel's sign act is for the people to know that God is sovereign. Three points. Then we reflect. This is a very hard sign, okay? The death of the wife and not, the, the, and not able to mourn. Ezekiel's sign act is for the people to know that God is sovereign. And we can say also that it is Ezekiel's suffering. Okay? But here's the thing amongst when we read all these things. We, we read these things and we say, ah, yeah, you suffer so much. Ah, you suffer so much. Ah, you suffer, 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 suffer. Ayo, pain, pain, pain. And we and we focus on the pain. We focus on the suffering. But I also want to encourage the servants of God suffer is cannot be the main focus. Focus also on their obedience, their faithfulness, their love for God, their devotion to God. They suffer true, but let us not focus on that. And to know that God is sovereign. Then sometimes people say, Ayo, God, why are you like that? You should not do like that because if you want to tell us that you are sovereign, surely there are better ways of doing so. God, you should not put your servants to shame. You should not put your servants to pain just to send a message. But bear in mind, the focus should be, why are they doing this? Tell me what. If the Jewish people listened to God, if the Jewish people obeyed God, Ezekiel did not have to suffer. True or not? The main reason why Ezekiel had to suffer was because he, God used him to send a message to the people. So it was for who? It was for the people. If people behaved themselves, the prophets didn't have to go through all the suffering. If people listened and obeyed the gospel, if people listened and accepted the, the, uh, the Jesus Christ, if people did not persecute Christians, then none of the missionaries now have to suffer. It is because they love people. Because they love God. They do this all, it's our devotion. I can tell you right now, God does not take pleasure in suffering. Meaning that you go home right now, you take away from people. And then, oh, I'm in pain, I'm in pain. God does not enjoy such suffering. Or you put a needle and you choke choke yourself, or I'm suffering. God does the suffering servant, so I suffer. No! The purpose of suffering over here is for the people. It is a message, it's a tough message. But through this suffering, they show how much they love God, how faithful they are to God, how good God is to them, regardless of their suffering. So therefore, brothers and sisters, God's love for you is so deep that He calls His obedient servants, He calls His obedient uh, servants whom He loves to suffer for your sake. The servants of God suffer. And I tell you what, Ezekiel suffers for whom we say that he suffered for the Jewish people. Ladies and gentlemen, he also suffers for you. <coughs> because these are words in the scripture. And these are words meant for us to read, to reflect, to listen. So all the things that the prophets have done is for the sake of generations and generations of Christians afterwards. They are read by all of us. 
But there is one servant that has suffered much more and was prophesied by the prophets. There is one suffering servant and he said, This servant, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Taken from Isaiah 53. There is one suffering servant who took upon himself to suffer, again voluntarily. He was not chained, thrown into a jail, and then punished involuntarily. Screaming to get out, screaming to get off the cross. There was one person who voluntarily went and suffered. God's love for you is so deep that He sends His only Son, whom He loves, to suffer for your sake. So while we know the suffering servant, the suffering Christ, while we know about God, let us also remember that these things are all done for us. The cross was done for us. And then we ask, and we have people saying that, won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Won't you tell us what does Christ's death do with us? How does a person who died 2,000 years ago have to do with me today? And all of us, whether we're missionaries or not, we are supposed to answer this question. Jesus Christ's sacrifice was for the people to know that God loves us. He was on the cross. He suffered because He took your sin and mine and He took it on the cross and He bore the wrath, the judgment of God. And by doing so, He saved us from our sins. You and me. And again, the suffering servants, they do it for the people. And so we should share the word of God with other people around us, the people we love, the people that we don't love, we should share the will of God. For Jesus Christ's sacrifice is also for you to know that God loves you. So if today you do not know that Jesus Christ loves you, that God loves you, that God knows you, I want you to know that indeed the scripture is true and I testify that the Bible is true, that God loves you very, very much. And He loves you so much, He sends His servants whom He loves. To suffer for you, he says his only son to die on the cross for you. Thank you very much. God bless you.